today. And before we deep dive into the webinar and before I introduce also our uh, key speakers of today's webinar, let me just give you a bit of a background story. How did we set up this topic? Uh, Esther, one of our key speakers, uh, told me a couple or told us in marketing a couple of months ago, hey, we are getting so much questions from, uh, uh, from our customers, from our prospects about uh, doing business outside of the domestic market and especially outside from the UK. So, and those questions are very technical or they, they can be very, very niched. Uh, can we do a webinar about it? And for me as a person in marketing, you know how we do things, we just press a button, but I really didn't know how important it, it is for other functions, finance function, administration function, operational function, did they do their setup correctly and rightly before the expansion starts, that the things can go smooth and that the growth can go uh, much, much easier. So that said, uh, we have with us in today's webinar, uh, Esther, our UK specialist, who will guide us through this very important and very insightful topic. Along with Esther, we have also our commercial director, uh, Walter, who will be in charge for Q&A. And I always like to have Walter in the Q&A part then because I can smuggle some of the questions what I have for him in that, in that bit. Uh, so feel free to ask him anything. Uh, and we will have Q&A part in the middle and in the end of the webinar. Uh, we would like to have you engaged as much as possible and also to share your cases with us if that's possible. Okay. Let us go into a few, a few housekeeping points of today's webinar. The total time, how, how much we booked, it's 50 minutes. With a plenty of time for Q&A, and, and as I mentioned, so we will have two Q&As. One will be in the middle of the webinar and the second one will be at the end of the webinar. So feel free to, to drop any questions in the chat box. Along with the Q&A part, we will have two polls uh, for us for today and we are recording the webinar. So. If you miss on something or if you would like to share the, uh, the, the webinar with your colleagues, feel free to do so. We will send you a recording right after the webinar. So it's done like a couple of days. We need to also to edit a bit or two uh, in it. Uh, along with that, uh, we also uh, would like to start the webinar. I think that they took a bit longer than I should. Uh, Esther, the floor is yours. And let's start with this really cool topic. Thank you so much, Vorda, uh, and welcome everyone also from my side. Hi, my name is Esther, and please be welcome joining this webinar. We are touching on scaling your subscription business abroad, as Vorda was mentioning. It's 12 a.m. here, by the way, and it's a very beautiful sunny day in Stockholm, I hope on your side as well. And let's get started. So let's talk a little bit about growth first. I believe we are all here because we want to grow our business and we are looking for inspiration. So we see that growing your business is usually not a nice to have for many SaaS and software companies, but it's a requirement basically to stay alive. And growing means that you can be self-sustainable when you reach a certain level and there will be no need for external investments and you can be self-sufficient in running your business, a goal that is shared by many SaaS companies. And you can also see here like a few of the SaaS companies that we are currently working with at Unium. Um, so a lot of inspiration is uh, from them as well, of course. Um, so there are many ways to grow your business, but today we specifically talk about geographical expansion. In this webinar, we want to tell you about a couple of tips and tricks that help you successfully grow your SaaS business in and from UK. If you have ambition to go abroad, there are many things different, obviously, uh, from doing business in US. So we will cover things like doing business in US, uh, sorry, doing business in UK. Um, and we will talk about doing business in US. Uh, we will zoom in also on handling multiple currencies a little bit, Brexit and tax reporting. We will close all this knowledge with some of our recommendations on when to open a legal entity abroad and when to just keep invoicing from UK. And finally, we will also tell you a little bit about how one of our customers currently operates their business. And as always, we close our webinar with room for question in the end. Uh, but we have also a few nice Q&As um, in, in the meantime uh, during the webinar. So assuming that you are here because you have international ambition, which is a very common goal for a SaaS company. What we experience is that geographical expansion is probably the most common one that can also have a very high impact. 
typically this is realized by selling either from UK to other countries or expanding to other countries and sell from there. The downside is that it's not that simple. Aside from the different types of people that you meet, different ways of the, doing business, there are many other things that come with the geographical expansion regarding the finance side of business. And today we want to zoom in on a lot of those, those topics and hopefully give you the tools to further expand your business. So we have our first um, poll coming up, like I mentioned. Okay, uh, our first poll, uh, we, we would like to know, are you currently planning or uh, selling outside of UK? So if yes, already selling outside of UK, planning to expand, not yet, but orientating into possibilities for long term. So feel free to drop in your answer and uh, we will also have Esther to comment uh, uh, what, we, yeah, what, what, what answers did you give and what insights maybe we have on those, okay? So Esther, everyone in today's webinar say they are already selling outside of the UK. So that's also very good for us to know for like, what do they, what they, they have in place or maybe some of the questions we can already have in the chat box about it for Walter maybe to go over it. But do you have any comments for, for people who are already selling in UK, uh, what this could mean for them? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, really cool to see that uh, many of you are already selling outside of UK, everyone already. Um, so there will be a couple of things uh, to, of course, um, take into account and that you're probably running into at the financial back end of your organization. So um, yeah, let's, let's continue with that. And really nice to see that, uh, that you're already uh, being abroad and already um, expanding your business in that way. So today, now it's time for the uh, first topic of uh, today's webinar. We are starting off with handling multiple currencies. When um, you're operating out of the UK, you will also be dealing what you're also already doing with currencies other than the lovely quid, pens or great digits pounds. And typically in SaaS, we speak about sales currency and reporting currency. We will go a bit more into that now. The selling currency is the price that you sell your product for in different currencies. And usually with SaaS companies, we see that when a product is priced 100 great British pounds, it will usually be priced for 125 US dollars but, and for 100 euros. But of course, there's also cases that 100 great British pounds is 125 euros. Um, as you will see through this webinar, at the same time, it takes a bit more effort to sell abroad, so you might as well make a bit more money during expansion. Um, another thing to keep in mind is what the market pricing of your product is in the region that you are selling to. So for example, it might be that when you're selling your solution to the United States due to a higher perceived value of your service there, that you can also have a higher pricing in place. So let's go to a few more um, of the currencies, uh, moving on with selling currency then. The selling currency is also the currency that you put on the invoice and is ultimately also paid by the customer. The exchange rate differences are usually paid by the supplier. Um, the reporting currency, on the other hand, is the currency you report your business performance in. So the reporting currency is usually linked to a legal entity from which that you sell. If the legal entity reports, for instance, in US dollars, it can also still sell as euros to another country. However, the reporting currency or base currency is a currency that is typically used by the entity for founding and establishing the company and is also report, uh, used to report taxes. Um, there are many exceptions of companies that, for instance, founded their company in UK, but they established their first entity in US or in Europe if they believe that's where their target market was. We will come back to that later. So moving on to US, let's um, take a little flight over there. United States of America. It's um, for many of us, it's an attract attractive market for international expansion. Um, we're very curious to know if it's for you as well. Um, you see what we see that a lot of UK businesses um, prefer to as well sell to US. 
So as your SaaS business scales, like going into the practical side of things, it became more and more complex to comply with sales taxes, but this goes to a whole other level when you're selling from and into the US. Um, so some tips and tricks around here. Um, heads up, this scenario only applies if you have or want to establish a legal entity in the US from which you sell and invoice customers that are also based in the US. If your business serves customers in the US, you need to comply with sales tax laws specific to each US state where you will meet the registration thresholds. The letters look a little bit small on the image. You can see in the overview that the green states are where digital goods are taxable. The blue ones are where digital goods are not taxable and the gray ones don't have sales tax at all. So let's, let's dive a little bit deeper into this. If your business is selling SaaS software or digital products and service in a US state, you may be required to register and pay sales tax in that state, regardless of whether you have a physical connection there. This is called economic nexus. Another thing that's good to know is that in 2018, South Dakota raised a new compliance standard where they realized that they were lo losing billions of dollars in sales tax because sales tax only had to be paid if you had a facto presence in one state. Since the introduction of the standard, most states have since then followed the suit and imposed their own connectivity standards. Um, what is a sales threshold, you might ask? A sales threshold is a fixed amount of revenue in that country's currency. So when your revenue exceeds the threshold amount, your business is required to register for local taxes. Different states in US set different thresholds and may require different evaluation periods and enrollment times. So this is quite tough to take uh, to keep track of as a SaaS leader. So make sure that you're aware of this connectivity loss. This is a problem that many this is a problem that many similar companies are running into. So you also can see in the in the PowerPoint slide that there's more than 14,000 tax jurisdictions in US, each with its own rates, rules, and regulations. So you can imagine how difficult and confusing it is to track the taxes. We therefore suggest you, that you read our blog, which Monica will add to the chat as we speak now or after the webinar, to be slightly better informed about this. Last but not least, make sure that you have a subscription management and billing partner uh, that knows and understands these challenges and also connects with relevant tools like TextJar, for instance, to ensure that you uh, apply the right amount of sales tax um, always upon sending the invoice. If you do that, then all of this information is almost irrelevant as we take care of that for you. So here's a, a question I'm wondering, it's not in the screen, but it's more interactive. So you can write the answer in the chat. Are you selling to and or from the US at the moment? A, yes, but we invoice from UK. B, yes, by an established legal entity in US. C, no, but orienting into possibilities in the long term. D, simply no. I'm handing over to uh, Walter at the same time. Uh, thank you so much, Esther. Uh, before we give the mic to, to, to Walter, let me just say I was so eager to jump into this topic that I forgot to mention Monica. So we have also our Monica Torres behind the scenes. So she's managing our chat box. As, as, as Esther mentioned that, feel free to check the chat box and see we will share a couple of very useful links and blogs uh, what can help you in your expansion and in your, uh, in your scale up uh, and also that are related to this topic. Okay, if you have any questions for us at this stage, uh, we will open um, the floor for questions. Uh, feel free to write them uh, in the chat or in the Q&A part. Uh, and Walter will take over those uh, yeah, now. And we have a first question already here. So I can maybe start with this one and then we can see uh, another one if it comes uh, during, the, during the, your answer, Walter. Uh, so how does Unium handle reseller structure uh, that sells on behalf of your company, but in the different currencies on uh, one contract? This is oh, that's a, that's a nice complicated case. We love those. Um, so, uh, you know, typically you have specific agreements with resellers. One could be that you have, you know, the main contract uh, is, is where you agree that we as the supplier invoice the end customer, but sometimes you also make the decision that the reseller ends, uh, invoices the end customer. 
In that case, you of course get one master contract when you uh, when the reseller invoices the end customer and you just invoice the reseller in the currency you invoice in, uh, which was you know based on the foundation of the contract. But if you of course have an agreement uh, with like the end or with the reseller, but you invoice the end customers, you can invoice any currency you want with a tool like Unium, uh, and then of course a kickback. Of that's typically the case in a reseller structure like that uh, will then be calculated and then we'll tell you the reseller will get this amount over these kind of currencies and then you know does the group um, you know calculation in terms of what was the exchange rates on the kickbacks and then makes one combined total wow. so very nice uh, practical question yeah, very very practical question we have one more um, and and this is also before the webinar when we when we were conducting the topic it, it landed very nicely and the question is also related to this does union have customers or office in usa so we, we heard now from esther how complicated it is with all of the tax your jurisdictions what they have and and how you need to like be able to to, to automate the whole process mm -hmm. there this is a very 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 good question so yeah. do we have any customers in usa and let's also and also celebrate office. this yeah. big thing uh, do we have an office yeah, yeah. so uh good news is you know uh, esther spoke about the fourteen thousand tax jurisdiction uh we have esther and she knows all of them by heart no of course uh, not but we have an office in us with skilled people we also have customers in us and and like esther mentioned and i'll also briefly talk about that in a minute uh, we have integrations to, you know, people who have made this their business, their core business, uh, to look into those 14,000 uh, tax jurisdictions mm -hmm. and make sure these are live updated because they can literally be updated per zip code per kind of minute. Uh, so, you know, to maintain that, uh, even for Esther, is impossible. So uh, mm -hmm. that's why we have these fantastic tools we, which we speak with. Uh, but we have an office uh, in Philadelphia. It has been formally established earlier this month, I think. So it's uh, brand new, uh, but we, uh, yeah, I don't want to give away too much as to why we did that because Esther will tell our uh, dear audience that later. Yeah, and this is really good uh, that we on our example and on our experience try to help you how you can do your foundations right. And I'm really, really glad to see the other question what we got just now and uh, it's also related to us. Can Union support both report, reporting currency and different pricing currency? So how this tool and how the tool can help in this this very complicated uh, matter. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So typically the selling currency is kind of, you know, the amount that has, you know, been agreed with the customer. So you had a customer from Europe, uh, they bought something in euros, um, mm -hmm. you know, it was on your website as a European price. So, you know, that's, that's of course, you have uh, in Unim, you have your product structure, and then you can also set up the different pricings for each currency. So that's mm -hmm. kind of the straightforward one. And uh, the reporting one, it's, it can be more difficult, so, for instance, in Union, you can set up more legal entities. So, you know, this is my office in Amsterdam, this is my office in Zagreb, and this is my office in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. um, each of them have different currencies. And, you know, you then ultimately have kind of group consolidation, uh, as, it's called, as it is called, where, you know, each of those report their native currency and it's then consolidated against the exchange. rate or if, as they call it um it's, it's gbp the great britain pound then you know the total you know mr or whatever will then be reported uh, based on the exchange rates of the sell, uh, selling time pretty much mm -hmm. so that's the more complicated one but that's the cooler one as well okay let me chip in one question from my end i'm quite curious knowledge information from so yeah. this is this is me asking you Marna. yeah so uh, this is again uh, you know uh, there's companies that make this their core business uh, so you in for instance in uk you have sage you have xero these are you know companies we like to speak to not only in terms of you know having actual conversations but also in terms of integrations with the finance system they usually are linked to you know the core uh, place where that is stored uh, you know where like the live uh, exchange rates are updated and we take that data um, via the API, via our connector from the finance system. So, you know, at the point of sending an invoice and it's time to report, we, we draw that, you know, um, information from the finance system. So it's always live uh, running up in our system. Great. Great info. Thank you so much, Walter. Uh, and we can continue with the presentation. Uh, we already gave a couple of uh, heads up what Esther will cover for us now in the next couple of minutes. 
Yeah, uh, I think uh, I I, uh, I can I can uh, speak say, say something about this. So you know, uh, within this West, uh, webinar, Esther already spoke to you about the U.S. taxes and how that framework is kind of uh, shaped. Um, you saw stuff about the fourteen thousand uh, different tax rules there. Uh, so maybe not memorizing them. Uh, we also want to quickly quickly give you. Uh, some tooling information around this. So what can you get to help you out with this? Because I mean, if you're keeping up with this yourself, you're not growing your business. So that's not a smart idea. Uh, at Junium, we have specialization in handling the different invoicing formats of European countries, uh, but we also have strong functionality and knowledge about the uh, US. So as Esther mentioned before, each state in US has different rules of when to add sales tax to what invoices. Um, there's a few tech solutions available in this space uh, around both applying specific invoicing standards as well as handling different currencies, which we'll quickly elaborate a bit on now. Um, if we were to go through all different nuances, different rules, legislations, and regulation, this webinar uh, would probably not take the 50 minutes uh, we said at the beginning, and will probably not be even finished this year. Uh, so therefore, we try to build Union in a way that it helps ambitious growth companies like yourselves taking care of things like uh, which tax to apply uh, via integration with tax jar, or is it it allows to uh, you know uh, add the real time tax uh, on sending the invoice, or if you run offices in different countries, you know you can integrate different banks to Union, or by applying typical rules and regulations around direct debit. Uh, which can uh, differ a lot too. Um, so rather than giving our customers a rule book of what to do where, uh, we try to solve this with kind of our one stop shop. I think we're doing a nice job there. Uh, and rather than building and maintaining everything, you know, we talk about uh, ourselves, we focus on the right integrations um, with the companies that have this relevant area of expertise. You know, we centralize this information on the subscription uh, and it comes out pretty much during the billing process. So in addition, uh, we, of course, integrate with relevant finance systems, as I also said in the Q&A, um, uh, to make sure that we get you know, the payment terms, the exchange rates, and other relevant data uh, needed in the quote to cash process. Uh, the strength of our you know, uh, subscription hub, as we call it, is that we aim to generate one source of truth to ensure uh, you know, your customers always get invoiced in a correct way, uh, which ensures uh, also on-time payments which can be good for the cash flow. I want to talk to you uh, about one more thing. Uh, so that's Brexit. I think it's already a bit in the rear view mirror for you guys, but it's good to quickly touch upon what has changed uh, versus the previous scenarios, specifically looking at kind of our SaaS industries. Um, so most of it had impact on the GDPR and privacy uh, related data handling. So even though GDPR is kind of European standard, if you sell to EU companies, it's still is important to stick to, uh, or if your SaaS solution monitors behavior, for instance, of EU data subjects, it's like an AI tool. Um, also, there are many types of agreements we see in SaaS. So typically, uh, data processing agreements, privacy policies, terms and conditions, and standard contract templates that are actually needed uh, need to be adjusted to you know specific business rules in the EU. So also check if your supplies needed to facilitate. Uh, you know, your service live up to that. I think it's important. It's, it's boring, but it's important. Um, small advice as well is that there are SaaS uh, communities in Europe, for instance, that advise to do a risk, ass risk assessment when dealing with UK SaaS companies. So a good way for you guys to counter that is by stating in the sales process that you're knowledgeable about what Brexit means for you, uh, Brexit means for you and your prospects. You know, if you show them that you know then the risk assessment usually goes away quickly because you know they seem oh these people have, have done the thinking around it. So also please use the chat and send it to public uh, when trying to let us know uh, of, of your experience uh, within Brexit in SaaS to further you know aid your peers in this process as well. So you know the people who are joining this webinar can also see you know your experience. I think it's so valuable to learn from each other. Now I gladly hand back over to Esther to talk more about uh, which strategic choices companies may need to make when conquering uh, countries beyond UK. Yes, thank you. We have one uh, one poll in the meantime. Um, Hoparde, can you open it? Yes, of course. Let me just launch it. Is it up? Okay. Poll. 
Okay. Uh, which countries are you mainly dealing with taxes? Is it Asia, uh, East Pacific, USA, or European? So feel free to give your votes now. Cool. And we can end the poll. Uh, so we have majority, say, Euro European countries. So then also this bit what now uh, Walter tell, told us um, uh, on, on the Brexit part and, and how, how, how the process can be complicated, apply here for the European countries as well in that way. Uh, maybe you can give us a bit of a comment, Esther, or I went completely wrong there. <laughs> no, you're, you're completely right. Um, that, that's very true. Uh, regarding European taxes, that's definitely an uh, important topic and regarding Brexit as well of course. Um, so definitely will be good to look uh, into that. Uh, thank you everyone for responding um, and making this interactive and also for Walter for the, for the super nice uh, explanation. And um, let's move on uh, to uh, opening a legal entity abroad. Um, so of course you will run into this topic uh, better to establish a legal entity abroad or not so your SaaS business is growing and expanding and of course you're looking like how can i serve my customers best so within SaaS, it's often very doable to sell you to your customers digitally but as we all know in some cases it's a good idea to establish a physical office in another country so let's go through them uh, some businesses they require a physical customer support for example uh, there can be as well issues in communication um, with your customers due to a big time difference or the vertical of customers that you're serving they benefit from local knowledge um, so i also have a one in between question if you have uh, one more than one legal entity abroad or if you have one lead legal entity abroad at the moment and this is also not popping up in the screen by the way yeah, so feel free to drop the, the answer in the in the chat box. So how many legal entities do you have um, and where they're based? Uh, I'll wait for the answers and we can always make a discussion out of it. In the meantime, um, let's also have a look at the short uh, story uh, of a decision regarding our own business at Union to open a legal entity and a physical office in the United States, which we have in um, Philadelphia, as we mentioned before. So I spoke with our CEO, Nicholas Lilia, and he told me that um, there's a few reasons for us to establish a, a physical office in the United States, uh, both out of customer perspective, but also regarding contracts. Uh, so where do we want to do business, for example, and how do we do this? These are important questions. Uh, so let's move into from a market perspective, many of our clients, they are doing business in the United States and we definitely need to be where our customers are. So this is like something important uh, that you can consider. And then also, how do we do business? That makes sense as well, right? So we are, for example, not in the line of business or the nature of sales complexity that we have our customers signing up via credit card. For us, it's important to talk to people instead. And for that reason, we need to have uh, people on the ground. Uh, and talking, lastly, as well, time difference. Um, opening another hub for this reason in the US uh, made a lot of sense for us. So it's a suitable solution. Uh, in essence, what I can say about um, opening a legal entity, a separate legal entity simplifies a lot as you kind of establish a separate business with the focus on a specific region or country but when it's time to report the figures or handle the administrative task around this it can give some complexity so it's a little bit less um, less less fun then um, but i'm sure you're you're aware of that esther we have a couple of answers in the chat box for your uh, question so um, andrew told us uh, that they have one and that legal entity is based in uk uh, also, we have Walter saying Unium has three based. Uh, could you give us a bit of a comment on those? Yes, yes, of course. Um, so there's, um, uh, of course, reason that you still uh, have one legal entity. So then 
probably the need or the pressure is not that high yet regarding the topics that they just handled to open another uh, legal entity. Uh, it can be a very great solution for your business um, to do it that way if you don't uh, run into other uh, areas on how to serve your customers, basically. Yes, it makes perfect sense. Um, so now on the other side, um, next to opening a legal entity, we also have on the other side of the spectrum, we have um, keep invoicing from UK. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So first, what's important here, we see that in different countries, we deal with different invoicing requirements. So in mainland Europe, we are dealing, for example, with FAPO. And in the United Kingdom, we have to comply with ACMRC. So you don't need to fill out certain forms here, but the tool that you use for the invoicing, it needs to comply to those standards. Um, and then we basically invoice accordingly. And of course we invoice in the customer's uh, national currency, except for some cost around exchange rates, it's all good so far. However, what we might run into is that not all traditional finance systems support the revenue operations internationally when it comes to reporting and financial management. So be aware. For many companies, an important aspect of reporting on revenue streams is, of course, to understand how well their business are doing financially, both in terms of current revenue, but also regarding growth in order to being able to steer the proverbial ship. So a practical example um, regarding this topic is that some of our customers are, they are operating in the education industry and they serve, serve many B2B customers globally, but they do this with just having two legal entities in place to avoid all this uh, hassle. Um, and what the revenue data tool such as Unium does instead of the traditional finance system is to store both transaction as well as the base currency. And this means that it's um, uh, to easily extract data on VAT, revenue, and so on, um, with one push on the button, basically. So prior to that, many companies, um, they are for forced using spreadsheets for this to store those and additional data for their re reporting. Um, so bear with me here. As a result, to, uh, to solve the struggle around missing functionalities regarding the accounts receivable and finance reporting function for SaaS companies. We have seen that many SaaS companies, they have gone apart of having multiple finance systems in place for their code to cash process. And, as the, and this we heard resulting in different ways of working per country as well. At the same time, they're growing more overhead, especially if you're like a bigger, size SaaS companies or a SaaS company already. So especially regarding the uh, bigger size companies, uh, when it's time to evaluate their current processes around this, their finance system and the different systems that they have in place for accounts receivable and financial reporting, they come to uh, Union to solve this. And one of the problems left to resolve after all the mentioned scenarios is to first consolidate the revenue and then easily state out the cost regarding the exchange rates. Um, so that's all on the um, financial side. Um, so then what, what is better? Um, yeah, it's a very, very good question. Uh, we truly believe, um, as it ha has become probably a, a bit more clear now, uh, it really uh, depends on the type of business that you run. So instead of giving you the answer, we would basically like to get, uh, leave you with more questions around this so that you can ask yourself to best make this uh, decision. A few of these questions are, do my customers care if I'm in the same country or not? So do my customers need to be educated on the solution that I'm selling and the thinking behind it? Do my customers expect me, for example, to have face-to-face -face meetings with me? Um, and do they care a lot that if they are in the same time zone or not? And so, for example, if there is a bug, do they expect me to pick up the phone and like talk with me in the coming minutes, like 24 seven uh, hours? So besides, it's also good to look at like, uh, let's examine if we have the funding and the core foundation um, to, uh, and the structure to start expanding. Can I hire employees, for example, in a perhaps more expensive country? Uh, do we have an HR setup and do we have processes in place that someone do that doesn't sit next to 
the finance person um, that uh, who can also understand that. And if we spend the money, what is our expected increase in revenue, obviously, and time to ROI? It's important to make a business case for that as well. Um, and lastly, do we have the systems in place to do it from here? If we stay here, what do we need and what do we miss in terms of pricing, processes and tools? So these are like a few questions that we would like to leave you with. Um, and th those are learnings from uh, many of our existing customers. So I hope that the, these questions do great things for you. And of course, if you want to spar with us more about it um, or with one of our customers, then feel free to uh, reach out and um, it will be interesting to go through this uh, journey together. So thank you a lot for bearing with us through this webinar. We hope that you found most of the topics interesting. Again, as mentioned, feel free to reach out to us later or start prepping your questions in the chat so we can cover this in a few minutes. But before that, um, let's summarize a bit what we talked about today and learn about how um, one of our customers uh, has used Unium in addition. Um, so first thing we talked about was compliancy. Um, so different compliance is needed for tax reporting, privacy, data processing agreements, etc. cetera. I both touched on those. Uh, make sure that you're up to par when moving abroad and that you cover more than uh, the UK local guidelines. Second is currency support. Either if you sell from the UK from an, uh, to another, or <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> either if you sell from UK, or from another country, your customers most, most likely see the pricing um, in the invoice showing up in their base currency. Uh, so in their minds, that helps them better understand what they pay for uh, for the value that they receive from you. So that's um, uh, regarding currency. And then other topic was the US. Uh, make sure that you find the invoicing solution that covers the high maintenance US tax compliance, a subscription hub like Unium that integrates the proper tax via tax are truly saves you a bunch um, of hours on a monthly basis. So last but not least, we recommend you to find a system that kind of covers most of the information we discussed today. So handles the billing, manages your tax, supports multiple currencies for reporting and billing. It's crucial if you want to scale that you don't, help it, don't end up with five legal entities running five separate finance system, basically. It will not be a smooth uh, operation. So trust us. Seems that was that all was a... for mine. Ah, yes. Sorry, Esther, but seems that I was a bit close when in the beginning of the webinar when I said push one button. With the finance system or the system what you now mentioned, in this case, Unium, you truly can push one button and then you tailor everything into this one hub connecting it through your finance system is it is it crm or something else and then into one hub like unium that can uh, automate all of the processes currencies and everything else what you mentioned yeah okay uh before before we go into the q a part and thank you so much esther for a really really good presentation uh again it was very insightful to see how important it is that you make the preparation before you start the expansion uh, and if anyone of you would like to get this presentation feel free to reach out to us via email or reach out to esther as she said we are always welcome to spar with you always welcome to check your case i uh, love the checklist what you shared uh, so if you would like to get also that checklist with the questions what do you need to have then feel free to drop us an email uh, before we go into the Q&A part, and feel free to drop any questions in the chat box or in the Q&A part of, the, of this webinar. Monica is monitoring those and we will then send it also and cover them during the webinar. I mean, at the end, uh, let us just say a bit of a Unium and who we are. So Unium, is, we are founded in 2017 in Sweden. Currently, we are op operating uh, in three markets, uh, Sweden, Netherlands, there we have offices, I mean, and USA, uh, but all across, uh, all across the Europe, we have customers and we are niched and tailored for B2B SaaS scenarios. So we are working with B2B SaaS companies and we think, I mean, think we are sure that we can provide there uh, the most value and the most benefits uh, for you to scale up. Okay, let us go now into the Q&A uh, part of the webinar and let us see if we have any questions. Yeah, first question is there. 
if Unium does tax reports, does it have finance system capabilities, uh, Walter, uh, that it can handle also those those tasks? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, very, very good question. So Unium, to be clear, is not a finance system, it's a subscription management system. But one of the modules we have is called accounts receivable. So we deal with the, we, we call ourselves optimists, we only deal with the money coming in and not with the money going out. So you know, anything that can impact a subscription uh, can be part of the accounts receivable process, such as dunning, uh, you know, getting, uh, sending out reminders for your outstanding invoices and stuff but also the tax reporting. I mean, we take care of the invoicing, we take care of kind of, you know, where the source of truth is, so we can also run the accounts receivable part of that. So we're not a finance system, but we can handle accounts receivable kind of in full and quite extensively, I might add uh, as well, which also, you know, to Esther's point, uh, if you have multiple legal entities, each has maybe, you know, in the US we run in um, uh, QuickBooks and in UK we run Zero, and in uh, Germany we run Stage as an example. Uh, it can be quite cumbersome to consolidate all of that. That's why we always, you know, our customers then start to use accounts receivable in Unium and they, you know, Unium then sends out segmented journals to each finance system. So, uh, you know, uh, Xero is up to date, Sage is up to date and QuickBooks is up to date in terms of what has been invoiced, what has been paid and how is the revenue recognized. So uh, that's a very nice way to combine that. Um, of course, when opening multiple legal entities, it is best to find a finance system which can run in each dependent country, but um, there's also uh, companies that focus on acquisition. So if you have acquired a company in US, it is likely they had a finance system and it's not a UK based one. So that's where the accounts receivable module is, is very handy um, for our customers. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, I hope the answer. Yeah. Um, the other question is also connected to something what you now mentioned. Can Unium support mother child legal entity structure? So yeah. is this yeah. available also in Unium? Yes, yeah, very good question. So uh, of course uh, in Unium that is possible. So you have uh, mother and child as it's called uh, hierarchy mm -hmm. in the legal entities. So you could have, you know, this is my group LTD uh, company in London, uh, mm -hmm. but I also have a legal entity in Amsterdam uh, but, you know, they run and they sell in euros and they, you know, do reporting in euros and then Unium just picks it up, does the exchange rates and consolidates that with, you know, the London revenue as an example. Uh, but, you know, the LTD is the, the mother entity and Amsterdam is a child and you can have multiple childs, but you can even have, you know, <laughs> it's not called, I don't know if it's called mother, but you can even have like grandmother structures where you have, you know, the you have entities below the Amsterdam one because Amsterdam uh -huh. made a, made a, made an acquisition in Rotterdam, whatever. Uh, so then you can have you know grandparents. So you can build that complete hierarchy uh, out in Union. Mm -hmm. um, I think I made up a word here, Avoria. So I'm not sure if grandmother structure is a thing now, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you have inter one question is related to the UK finance systems? Do you, do does Union have integrations to UK finance systems? Yeah, so it's a good question. So UK finance system is of course of course a big word. I don't think we have all of them. Okay, <laughs> we have we have one the ones to the you know the, the familiar names if I can say that uh, mm -hmm. we have integrations to those. If if we don't, what we usually do is with our customers we try you know to kind of do the work on the integration so we built the connector of course and then you know together with the customer we fine-tune and optimize it so it fits their process and then after that it becomes an off-the-shelf connector but we build it together with our customers if, mm -hmm. if you can uh, for the first ones we don't have of course yeah um currently in the chat box monica shared a couple of uh, i mean the link to our connectors page so if feel free to bookmark it and check it later after the webinar uh, what connectors do we have um, there is also a question, do you have a support for monthly overtime revenue recognition non-prorated? Uh, non-prorated, yes. So that's a common one in the finance systems. So um, typically what revenue recognition in, uh, for instance, like Xero does is it takes the yearly revenue, divides it by 365, so it makes kind of a daily revenue, and then allocates 31 days of revenue to January, allocates 28 to February, and allocates again 31 to March, which means if you look at your MR reporting, you get fluctuations, because it looks like January is always performing better than February, but it just has less dates. 
Mm -hmm. That's the non, uh, or that's the prorated one, if I can call it. At Junium, we take kind of, you know, if an example, if you have 100 uh, GBP uh, per month subscription uh, and you invoice it annually in advance, so 1200 GBP, it will allocate 100 euros to Jan, 100 to Feb, 100 to March, etc. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, the non prorated, and we have indeed support for that. Cool. Um, and I'm really glad uh, one of the attendees, uh, they went to check our website. Uh, so I saw on your website that you also have a quotation model. Can this generate things like data processing agreements and terms and conditions? So we know that that's also very important to have those foundations right there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think this comes down to kind of the things we covered in the, you know, uh, agreement portion of this webinar. Mm -hmm. um, so how we work with our quotation tool is that you can, depending on the scenario you're sending quotations out for, you know, it can be a price indication, it can be a full contract proposal. Uh, depending on that, we work with templates so that when you want to send somebody a price indication, it may be a flashy looking document with these marketing cool pictures, you know, it's, it's a bit more fun and has like one line on the product is going to cost X. Uh, but when it's time to send that full contract offer, you have a different template, which maybe includes the data processing agreement. It, dates, uh, it, uh, it uh, includes something like a GDPR statement or whatever. Uh, so yes, uh, we, we, we have that support. Great. With this, uh, we are done with questions. Only if someone maybe have, uh, has something else to ask, uh, Walter and Esther, the floor is, the floor is still open. Uh, and before we wrap up today's webinar, let me just mention, we will send you the recording. So if you want to share it with anyone, feel free to do so. If you would like, or if something pops up later after the webinar, Esther and Walter are always open uh, to chat with you, connect with them on their LinkedIn profiles, or just send them an email. Uh, and that's always uh, like open, uh, open spot for you to spar with them. Okay, we have one more, and that one is uh, one more question. Uh, that one is, does the contract template also come with digital signature capabilities? Very good question. Uh, yes, it does. Um, mm -hmm. That's the short, <laughs> short version. <laughs> so once you finalize your quotes, you can send it out for e-signature, if it's called uh, mm -hmm. to your prospect. Great. Right. And that also, uh, maybe to add, so sorry if it's too much detail, but it also then integrates back to, for instance, your CRM. Mm -hmm. So then in the CRM or in Union, you can also see, you know, what is the e-signing status of, you know, my quote that I send out. So, you know, like the prospect has opened it, the prospect has clicked, or he has not even, or she has not even opened it, uh, as an example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very valuable info. I, I mean, we also use it in the marketing, something similar, you know, and checking how open goes and what does it open that yeah, really really good one also to have this functionality to see on the open uh, opens of the state is really good okay let's let's wrap up for today's webinar only if some as said if any questions come uh, after the webinar we are always more than welcome to answer those uh walter and uh, esther check them on linkedin uh feel free to send an email uh and uh, yes we will send you the recording uh, in a couple of days time uh just that we yeah we need to make it ready uh thank you so much for joining us and we truly hope that you learned something new today and that we helped you to grow more in your uh in your plans have a nice day thank you so much all bye bye